Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Felicia Tyler. A tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz, Seth Meyers. Tracy Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. This is Alia Einhorn. Welcome back to the Talk House Podcast. We have an amazing show for you today. None other than Death Cab for Cuties' Ben Gibbard in conversation with Alan Sparhawk of Lowe. We have a very special guest on the show today. TalkHouse's brand new executive editor. Please welcome Josh Modell. Josh, thanks for joining us, man. Oh, I'm so excited and I'm very flattered by that intro. Now, listeners, Josh and I met back in Chicago. I was playing in the band Scotland Yard Gospel Choir. Josh, you were running the Onion AV Club at that point, right? That is correct, yeah. And Josh Caterer, he of the Smoking Popes, was coming in to record a cover version and tapped my band to be his backup. Now, Josh, had you asked him to come in for this series? I did, yeah. So that was the AV Club Undercover series, or specifically the summer version where we kind of did covers of bands doing stuff in, That's in right. weird outdoor locations, right? So we were up on a rooftop and uh, asked Josh to do something, and, and he brought you and some other folks along. Yes, yes. He called me up and said, Elia, I am covering the Smiths for the Onion AV Club, and I need you to come and bring your violinist. So, so a third of Scotland Yard Gospel Choir rolled out and played with him. And, and that was so fun. And uh, Josh, we are so happy to have you over at Talk House, man. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'm so happy to be at Talk House. Josh, you put together a very cool episode here. Both artists are what I can only refer to as indie rock royalty. Absolutely. And, you know, this is sort of a perfect storm of my taste. <laughs> Josh Core. Uh, yes, that's pretty much what it is, I feel like. I've followed Low and Death Cab for Cutie literally since the beginning of both bands. I, th- I think I saw Low within probably six months of them forming and definitely saw Death Cab, you know, back in 98, 99. So this is sort of a special treat for me. Well, it's a special treat for me. I have played with Ben Gibbard multiple times. He and I joined forces on stage once to cover what was called the worst song ever written, uh, Porcupine Pie by, I think, Neil Diamond. And uh, also Scotland Yard opened for Low. These are both artists that I really enjoy personally. And of course, this is Ben's second time on the podcast. We introduced him to his then future tour mate, Lauren Mayberry of Churches on an episode. Now, listeners, Ben Gibbard, of course, is the founder of Death Cab for Cutie. He was also half of the Postal Service. He's released a trio of solo records as well as various collaboration EPs over the years. Death Cab's newest record is called Thank You For Today. That just dropped over the summer in August. One thing that I thought was very cool is this record marks 20 years of Death Cab studio LPs. It's their ninth record, and this album focuses on change. There's a quote from the song Gold Rush. The lyric is, please don't change, stay the same. The record takes a look at many different types of changes in the band's lives, in their hometown of Seattle, and their own perception of time due to technology, due to becoming parents. Ben's spoken of, quote, living in highly accelerated times. Take a listen to them confronting change on Gold Rush. A false sense of permanence. I've placed faith in geography to hold you in my memory. I'm sifting through these wreckage piles Through the rubble of bricks and wire Looking for something I'll never find Looking for something I'll never find Taking the cold in my neighborhood Where all the old buildings stood Beautiful stuff, right, Josh? That's a fantastic song. It's their best single in a while, and that's coming from a guy who pretty much likes everything they do. There we go. Now, Low are also celebrating the anniversary this year. The band has turned 25 in 2018. That's right. It's kind of hard to believe. Uh, and it's amazing because this band, Low, has been so many different bands in that 25 years. They really never stopped changing. You know, they started in 93 as jokingly called sort of slow core, which is a, they were a three piece, right. very minimal. They're still a three piece. Um, very quiet. Husband and wife, Alan Sparhawk and Mimi Parker, beautifully intertwined their voices. And they've gone through some incredible transformations over the years. You know, one minute they'll make an absolutely gorgeous pop song that sounds like, you know, some classic 50s song. And then the next minute they drop something like Double Negative, which is their new album, their 12th album, just came out last month in September. And Basically, they've just added this sort of levels of, of abrasion and, and feedback and 
it's sort of a monster. And when I first heard it a few months ago, I was like, well, are people going to accept this? But I don't think they care. I think they're, they're constantly sort of pushing themselves. And what's been really gratifying for me to see, and I assume for them, is that the thing is getting incredible reviews. It really is, man. It has just taken off. Pitchfork gave it best new music and a huge score, one of the highest best new music scores I've seen in ages. Funnily enough, my wife Amy is the news director of Pitchfork, and she recently said over our morning coffee, this record is insane. It's their Yeezus. <laughs> <laughs> I love that description. And, and our producer, Mark Yoshizumi, first sent me a link to the record and said, you would not know this is low. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think there's such distortion and, and weird stuff. And, you know, they've done stuff like this every once in a while in the past. You know, they'll be, they, they did a collaborative EP with Spring Heel Jack, like in the 90s, which mm. is sort of a more kind of electronic vibe. And they've done stuff that's challenging, you know, before it, longer songs and sort of really almost scary songs, but never anything at this sort of consistently strong 45 minutes of intense, uh, Intense low. I don't know how, how to describe it other than to just say low, which is, I guess it's a cop-out. But it's, it's a fantastic record. It's a scary record. It deserves every nice thing that people have been saying about it. It is a scary record. I really felt like the distortion in it runs parallel to the distortion that the band are seeing in America under Trump right now. Some of the lyrics address that situation as well. But this is, this is not a happy record. This is not a feel-good record. No, it's twice the negative, if you think about it. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's true. I, mean, I think there are some moments of real beauty on there. And you know, just to not scare people off, I don't think it, it's, it's not super direct with the political stuff, but, but it's very smart with it and very, you, know, you can definitely relate to it as a person living in America in 2018 and how scary that is from day to day. So I, you know, I just think they've really hit it by really kind of jumping off a cliff and they've found a beautiful place to land. Let's jump off that cliff with them. Listeners, check out a clip from the track Quorum. Josh, I would not have known that was low. Yeah, it's surprising. It's definitely very different. And it's just incredible that they would have the instinct to do this and that they would do it even sort of knowing people are going to listen to it and say, well, this is not this is not what I thought I wanted from low. But right. clearly people are saying, <laughs> well, this is what I wanted from low. Amazing to me 25 years in. And I'm so psyched to see what they're going to do 25 years from now. Oh, for sure. For sure. Well, you know, and it's so cool hearing Alan discuss that with Ben. They also go 25 years back. Alan talks about the beginning of Low. Ben talks about the beginning of Death Cab and how he was directly ripping Low off to get the band started. I love that. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's, it's so funny. Like Low opened a string of Death Cab shows not that long ago, maybe five or 10 years ago. And Ben was saying something like, I can't believe that they are opening for us. Like, no, that's yeah. just, a, just a crime, <laughs> uh, which I wouldn't agree with, but it, you know, it's a very flattering thing to say. And, and obviously a very true thing. I, I think he's clearly like a, a really huge fan. The guys also get into musicians who change their sound to keep up with current styles and how they're definitely not doing that. Yeah, it's funny. I think Death Cab has sort of defined a style in a way, starting way back with transatlanticism and have never kind of been trend followers. And I, I think they could have made hits for themselves, especially over the last few years, and even with this new record. But they've sort of chosen not to. I mean, I think Gibbard has followed a muse uh, where it's taken him. And this new record is very mellow and, and you know, it doesn't sound like they're trying to get on the radio. Uh, it just sounds like here's what he wants to do. And listeners, the guys get into much, much more, including but not limited to how Modest Mouse's Isaac Brock spent a long time looking like he just crawled out of a dumpster. Josh, should we roll the tape? Yeah, let's hear it. I saw you guys in, I believe it was May or June of 1994, if I'm getting the dates right. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and I had gone to the OK Hotel to see Sunny Day Real Estate and Velocity Girls, kind of like a co-headline show. Right. Yeah. And yeah. there was uh, a band called Low, which obviously you're very familiar with, <laughs> opening the show. And I and your gear was I mean I'm 17 at the, at this time and I look on stage and you know I I see a snare and a cymbal 
Yeah. And um, and two very small amps. Yeah. I, I don't know if I've ever told you this before, but like in my mind at that point, I couldn't fathom what was about to happen to me. <laughs> Because I did, I had not heard your music at this point. This being obviously a pre-internet age, sure, I couldn't. Sure. I couldn't. My initial thought was like, this must be some kind of crazy punk band that is just really stripped it down to the most the 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 bare essentials of what you need to be technically a band, <laughs> <laughs> which is not far off from <laughs> what was going on. Yeah, and I just and and you you began your set and you know immediately became one of my favorite bands and I guess when you're young you have those kind of moments where you kind of stumble into something and you're young and impressionable and you have that kind of experience yeah and it uh, changes and, and, yeah yeah and so I'm curious if if you had a moment like that when you were a teenager where you went to see a band that you didn't you, you stumbled into it accidentally and it kind of changed you oh there's there's probably a couple points yeah I remember I remember an older friend Kind of a family friend taking me to see the suburbs. We were a Minneapolis band. They'd played up at a college. And I don't know, I suppose I was maybe 13 or 14 or something. And I had only just caught in the caught the early winds of punk and sort of underground music and sort of some, some things that were going on there. But to go to to go to the show and sort of experience the the sort of beauty and then aggression at the same time as in this sort of this community. Uh there was a moment in the set where the drummer stopped the song and started screaming at someone in the front row and throwing <laughs> his sticks. And I'm like, what, what's going on? They stopped, what's going on, what's going on? And apparently there was someone who was abusing their partner physically like, at the show, which, and in, to me, the fact that the band stopped and was sort of that aware and sort of that conscious and sort of understood their responsibility of who they were in that moment was really a strong thing for me. And it sort of just, it made it, uh, I guess, cross over into everything else that sort of meant something to me, I guess, up to that point, maybe. Yeah, just morally and then just creatively at the same time, you know. It seems to me that, you know, a lot of, a lot of musicians who kind of come out of, you know, punk or underground scenes have that aha moment where, you know, I, I was brought up with a particular set of rules for what constituted be a band, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and what, and, uh, you know, growing up in the 80s and in the early 90s, you know, there was this kind of, well, you have to be able to play with this level of proficiency in order to be on a stage. Yeah. And you have to look a certain way. And I love seeing when, I, you know, when you, you get, when you meet young people or, you know, you talk to people about their aha moment. Those are always such a great stories because everything that you've known about one's motivation for music and what's possible is completely blown up. And, you know, you get to see a path for yourself as a musician that doesn't involve technical proficiency. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were some, of, some of those moments were shows. Some of them were people you met. I remember a friend of my, uh, my, my father played drums in different bands when I was growing up and I remember the guy who played guitar in one of his bands sort of showing uh, my first instrument was the bass and I remember him showing me on the bass sort of the one four five pattern you know kind of the most blues and country and sort of eventually rock and roll sort of was based around and he sort of, you know within that lesson kind of telling me like you realize that most most songs really only messing around with about two, three chords, you know, they're based, kind of based around the system. And to me, that was a big aha moment. And that, that was sort of a moment where you realize like, oh, wait a minute, maybe I can, maybe I can play music. I really, really only need to know two or three chords. And of course, shortly after that, hearing should I stay or should I go and realizing indeed that yes, that you can do this with two, two or three chords. Mm -hmm. I even remember seeing a band one time playing in Duluth early on when I first moved here out of high school and sort of seeing the band playing and realizing it's true they are just playing <laughs> they're just playing a couple chords you know may, maybe uh yeah maybe I'll try out for a band but yeah yeah I don't know those are the big moments for me sort of like you kind of had, had mentioned those moments where you where where it's sort of windows into possibilities and the, it's sort of the windows into seeing yourself in in music sort of sets you on the path, perhaps, I don't know. 
Yeah, and so I guess I'm curious when, you know, I, I find the question of influences to be a pretty pedestrian and boring thing to ask someone about. Sure. Uh, and so I, you know, I'm certainly uh, ask, I'm not asking you to name what your, you know, quote unquote influences were at when you were, when you began the band. But I'm more curious as to how you settled upon that instrument set because it is such a unique. You know, I don't want to m- make everything about like back in the day, of course, but I still am fascinated to this day about how that became the instrument set that you chose. You know, at that point when you when you when you started the band. Yeah, when we started the band, we were we were. We're pretty intentional about the minimalism of it and even the quietness of it. I think part of it was sort of a little bit of that and then a little bit of wanting to convince Mim, <laughs> Mimi, to <laughs> be in the band, you know, and because and, it, it started with John and I, you know, we'd, we were friends and, and played, mm-hmm. in, played in other bands together and had st- started this conversation about this, you know, quieter, more minimal music kind of touching on, uh, you know, minimalist, minimalist composers, different things like that, Brian, you know, different things like that. But in order to convince, <laughs> convince Mim to join the band, I, I felt like, well, if, if, if I kept the drums simple, cause she had played, she had played drums in high school and in like a uh, marching band and the concert band and all that. So she, she could do that, but she had not played the drum kit, but I knew maybe all we needed was just a little bit of stuff going on. So yeah, so the minimalism and, and sort of the, there was a little bit of romance in the audacity of <laughs> doing it with just that that little amount of stuff and, and little tiny amps and simple, clean sounds. Yeah, it was part of sort of an aesthetic we were going for and, and it was a way of accommodating what I knew would be more comfortable for him. Basically, the three of us involved, it was like, where, where do we all, where do we all, all have common ground? And, 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 and that was the sound. It must have been, I'm sure it also made touring as easy as it could possibly be as far as <laughs> yeah. uh, backline goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We uh, toured in a pickup, little mini Nissan pickup truck with a topper for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I remember that was one of the most difficult barriers of entry for us in the beginning was... A van was, uh, and being able to afford trying. to carry your gear around, yeah. Yeah, transportation. I mean, we, we were... We borrowed uh, $2,000 from our bass player, Nick's mom, and she helped us buy this Ford Econoline that was, it was the kind of van that was really more set up just to go take the kids to camp and back. Uh-huh. It, and it, it was, you know, it had, it was like, it was carpeted on the inside. It had these tables that, a table that folded out and the, the bench seat turned into a bed. It was really, really plush f- for us, but it, it hit harmonic resonance over 55 miles an hour. And things just started falling off of it. (laughs) So there was, you know, the fact that we were able to kind of get it around the country (laughs) once in in a full U.S. tour in 99 and a couple of West Coast trips that involved it breaking down the year before is pretty incredible. But, you know, I've, I've often thought that, you know, very few, very few bands that I know that have been able to kind of sustain any kind of longevity, not necessarily a career, but longevity, began with a patron of some sort, you know, someone that, you know, I, I find, you know, indie rock culture to be a f- very collegiate and in, in some cases very moneyed musical genre to, you know, if we're going to lump it all in together. You know, we met in college, you know. <laughs> right. We, you know, we met in college and while none of us, we, we've certainly had our moments of being broke, I would never, I wouldn't you know, call any of us poor, you know, right. and we had, we had those people that helped us out early when we didn't have any money. And I'm curious if when you guys were starting, if you had someone who was able to help you out. Well, who our, our first tour, we definitely were jumping off the cliff. I mean, I think we had 400 bucks and, you know, two, two weeks of shows on the West coast and, you know, and we made it and I, we got home and still had maybe 200 bucks left. But, um, I think the trick with with us that was that we we had a couple early breaks. We were heard. I mean, we we sent a demo to Kramer, who produced our first couple of records, and mm-hmm. he handed us off. It was kind of perfect timing. He knew somebody that was working for a label that was looking for some new bands at the time, and he kind of handed us off to them. And it was a small deal, you know, but it was enough to make the record. So we 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 didn't go on the whole making the record. 
which I think was maybe an advantage. I think a lot of bands, you, you, you spend a lot of money making records, those first few records and stuff. And, and that, was, that was Vernon Yard, right? That was Vernon and, Yard, yeah. And, then you, and you guys recorded with Kramer at his place in New York, if, I remember, yeah. if I've read correctly, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. He had a studio just up on the, uh, the Nine, just up from the uh, George Washington Bridge. And uh, yeah, we did a couple records there. I, I don't know. That was kind of a break in that that wasn't a huge cost that we were putting in. Like you were talking about touring, for some reason we were able to kind of get out and get on the circuit and play to three or four people at a time and mm -hmm. sleep on floors and, and rely on friends and bagels and lettuce and and, uh, and cheap gas. And, and yeah, we, we just kind of did it on the cheap and, and uh, because we could do it in small vehicles. It was a little more reasonable. There was never any big thing where someone came along and said, here, we'll help you out. I mean, there were definitely moments over the years where kind of at zero, we thought, how are we going to live this next six months? You know, when, when Hollis, when, when Mim was pregnant and for, with our first kid, we were like, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> we don't, mm -hmm. You know, if we stop, if we stop touring, we're, we're out of money in four months. And, and we got a song on a commercial kind of right at the moment when we were sort of trying to figure that out and that ended up paying for that. So little little breaks here and there, you know, people playing us on stations that ended up sort of cascading into other people hearing it that wouldn't have other, otherwise heard us. Some lucky tours. We, we got on a tour right after the first record came out. We did a tour with Luna, uh, which was pretty great because it was 150 bucks a night. <laughs> Huge money. Yeah. Well, at the time, I mean, you could. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember. I remember actually make. I remember a year or two into it, kind of doing the numbers one time after a tour and realizing, okay, if we made, if we can play six nights a week and play, and get a average one hundred fifty bucks a night, we'll come home with a little bit of money. To, to, to yeah. Those out. early. <laughs> those those early tours where I mean, you know, I, I remember we did a couple small support tours early on in the band and. Just have, I mean, it's called a guarantee, obviously, but having that guarantee of there is $200 coming tonight right. was right. something you could actually budget on versus our first national tour we did in 1999. I, I, I recently found, you know, to call it a tour book is, is not really, you know, it's like some, some hot mail printouts with directions and like, you know, like, well, how much merch should we sell? And we had a record, a t-shirt, a seven inch. Yep. And I, I, there were many of these shows where <laughs> we would make $40 at the door and then there would be, we sold a seven inch, you know, and the <laughs> fact that we wrote it down on the sheet as if we needed to do account for it later, it was just really funny to me, you know, but I, I do remember like we had some early shows that were, we knew we were getting $300 for some inexplicable reason in, you know, uh, Columbus, Ohio. Right. And we knew we could get there. Okay. If we're in Minneapolis, we, there's nobody here. But uh, you know, if as long as that, as we get you know, to this we can, one anchor show. We're gonna, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Build a whole tour around that three hundred dollars show at the college. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Our big money show was on that tour ninety nine. Was a show at the University of Colorado. This is this is one hundred percent true. They they. You know, this big, big, massive green space in the middle of the college, you know, oh, yeah. like a football field. Right. And they had set up this uh, massive, like, Lollapalooza-sized stage. And um, we were getting paid $750. This was <laughs> the, the most money we'd ever seen. And uh -huh. why they were giving us this money, I we didn't understand at the time. But we we, uh, we were under the impression that, you know, everybody from the college is coming out to this show. Because yeah, it's the big it's thing. It's a massive thing. It's, you know, opening weekend of, this, of the school, this is going to be crazy. And they had dunk tanks and Velcro walls, like, lined up along the sides. And, oh, my gosh. You know, there were about 200 people there while the Velcro wall and dunk tank were active. But by the time we went on, they, all, they had removed all the concessions. <laughs> <laughs> and we were playing on this giant stage in, in front of liter literally five people. Oh. Literally five people. And, uh, and it's beautiful. We, it was great. We played the whole set, and then somebody from the news came over and was like, um, hey, uh, we're doing a small story about... Uh, opening weekend of school, and but we we didn't have a chance to we didn't film any of your performance. But if you wouldn't mind, we're going to be going live in ten minutes. So would you mind recreating playing a song for the for we're going to cut to on the news? So we said sure, and then everybody switched instruments, <laughs> <laughs> and we just uh, made noise for five minutes, and it was 
one of those experiences early on that you just go, Oh, good for, th- good that for was, you. That was ridiculous, but it was fun. I don't know. That is a good, that is a good memory. Yes, the headline, Band from Out of Town plays <laughs> Giant Festival for Five People. It was pretty fantastic. But even even on our worst tours, we still, I don't remember, I, I remember maybe one of those early tours that we came back having lost money. And thankfully, it was like a West Coast tour that we lost $200. But I think that we were, and I'm assuming you guys are the same way, that, you know, we every time we went out, there were a couple extra, more people there the next time. And, you know, we never we never really lost money. I think if we would have been one of those bands that spent two years trying to tour and kept losing money, we certainly wouldn't be talking right now. Yeah, yeah, two, two, three years. That's that's exactly about right about the time. It's like okay, maybe this is gonna turn a corner, and then yeah, yeah, it would uh, it would get pretty tough. I think after about four or five years, if you're still still losing money on those forty dollars shows, I'm trying to explain to your parents what you're doing. <laughs> Well, I guess I was able to listen to uh, your record that's coming out, I believe, next month in September. Is that correct? Yeah. And I, I just have to say, I, you know, kind of coming back around a little bit to I'm, I'm a 17-year-old kid. I'm, I'm watching you guys for the first time. I'm, you know, this very minimal instrument set, you know, creating this, you know, wonderful, uh, wonderful music that I still love so much. All these years later, you know, all, all of those early records are still really important to me. But one thing that I've been... It's been so interesting to me about your band is that, and I, I, I hope you take this the right way, but I, I really, I, I don't feel like I could have seen the evolution, given, given the early shows that I, I saw you play and the minimalism and the instrument set you were using back then. I love that as a fan of your band all these years later, you still surprise all of us who are fans of your band and still and are still kind of throwing a lot of curveballs there's a lot of a lot of unusual choices that still sound so much like low and you know this new record that you guys have coming out is just really beautiful and well, you, you know challenging challenging in a lot of ways as well i mean it's one of the things i love about your band is that you know when there's a new i i never know what i'm going to get with a new low record and unlike some other bands that i would say that about that's a compliment if that makes any sense well thanks ben that's very very kind of you um i guess i'm curious you know just about this new record and the last one seem to be i mean i think there there are kind of some tonal kind of touchstones between the two yeah, uh, yeah for but sure. But you know, I, I'm just curious as to kind of, you know, when you're going in, when you're going in to make this record, if you're hearing something in the in the writing of the record that you want to kind of see through to the fi- final the album as it's finished, or if you are just discovering that in the process of making the record. Well, I don't know. I mean, unfortunately, the answer is pretty boring. It's it's both. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, we we did go in pretty conscious of sort of a trajectory and I mean we we were working with BJ Burton again who did the last record Mm -hmm. and sort of the process of working with him has been kind of ever expanding and that first record with him we sort of found a little bit of our footing and sort of the possibilities and and uh but yeah as soon as we were done with that one we were already pretty conscious of where we were headed for the next thing and sort of already talking about it a little bit and it took a while. We spent a lot of time kind of just generating sounds, trying songs different ways. Some of it was dictated by the songs. Uh, a lot of it was dictated by what was going on in the world and sort of spanned the end of 2016 and into 17. And I think we were probably reacting a little bit to that and, and sort of driven even more so to want to make something that was aggressive and sort of reaching and trying to find something something new something sort of sort of spontaneous but also sort of sort of sophisticated kind of taking advantage of of the person that we were working with for sure i don't know if you're like this with your recordings but you go in kind of with okay i have some songs and sort of some pretty good ideas about how i want to do them and maybe depending on how you're feeling you're excited about trying to find something completely different or maybe find out what those unfinished things will end up being and and you go in and sometimes the thing that you thought was going to be really strong <laughs> ends up being a struggle and then mm-hmm. sometimes the idea that you thought was just a small thing ends up exploding and being uh, the anchor for for what eventually becomes the record but um 
Yeah, there were moments when we found, okay, this this is reaching deeper. You know, this is a sound I've never heard before, and it's almost all there. So let's let's do that. <laughs> yeah, I can certainly att- I can certainly attest to to your point that I- inevitably the songs that I bring in that I think are going to be the home runs, the immediate home runs, right, <laughs> are the ones that become the most labor intensive and difficult. And I I can't tell if that's because of my naivety in just thinking that things are going to be easy in the studio right. or that I hear them in my head a certain way and I just, and what I'm hearing in my head is kind of, is not creatively feasible. You know, it's a little bit of like, you know, when you hear your voice on a recording, is that how my voice sounds? Right, right. Because in my mind, I have a voice, you know, my, yeah, <laughs> my voice sounds like... Yeah, sound like this, but you're like, no, yeah, yeah. you sound like this. <laughs> yeah, actually, in my mind, I sound like George Clooney, but in actuality, I sound I have like a whiny, reedy voice, you know? <laughs> um, I, I totally understand what you're saying. There are also the songs on... I mean, for us on our new record, we have the song called Northern Lights that I was oh, immediately yeah. like, this one's going to be... We're gonna be, we're gonna knock this one out. This is gonna be like it's gonna be exactly the way I hear it in my head. And it was the, we labored and labored and labored over it. And then there are other songs that you bring in and you just kind of go. Eh, I mean, this thing is kind of a it's a thing. It's got a couple parts to it. I I you know who knows if this is going to kind of take off and then it becomes your favorite song on the record. Yeah. No, I uh, I, re- I hear what you mean. Northern Northern Light. It it still it still cuts through. I see what you mean though. There's some. Um, there's a complexity there that, that I think probably in the making, you probably were inevitably going to get hung up on a certain thing. You think it's going to be a certain way, but no, that, that song's strong. It's good. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was, that's, that's my favorite. I mean, there's, there's, other, there's other highlights for sure, but that was the one I'm like, oh, this is, this is very cool. Yeah, no, no, one, no one can hear the strife in the recording, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to listen to it again now, now that I know you had to labor over it, because, yeah, that's... That's a very interesting process sometimes. Yeah, and I think it's really the weight of expectation rather than the process itself that kind of <laughs> that kind of brings you there. And where what's BJ's background? Because it's it's one thing that's really struck me with the new album is just there's there's what I'm about to say could be taken the wrong way, but I highly mean it as a compliment. I I feel that there are there are so many kind of um, sounds on the album that. They they sound as if there was a piece of like a lexicon or something like that that had been water damaged or something like that, and then somebody plugged it in to see if it worked, and it made a sound that wasn't intended to make, and then you guys just went like, yeah, let's go with that. I mean, there are so many, <laughs> so many kind of some of a lot of the kind of the tones on the album are kind of they're rooted in something that you're familiar with, but they sound intentionally broken, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I think we're that was definitely something we were going for. We were. You know, we'd look at a song and say, "Okay, what does what does this song need? What what does the rhythm need to do? Does it really need to? Does it need to have all this, or does it just need a pulse? Or does it need does it need a click? Does it need something tapping along? Does it need is it a kick? You know?" And we just kind of boil it down to that and just sort of dig around and sometimes randomly stab at equipment, sometimes spend a lot of time twisting knobs and redistorting things and, and until you. I don't know, some, sometimes you're stabbing around in the dark until you find something. Sometimes you're bringing something to BJ going, I know this, I know there's something here, and I know this, mm-hmm. I know this is kind of doing what I want it to do, but it needs to be bigger. It needs to, how do I make this, how do I make this really crush, you know? And then he'll, you know, he has enough of a palette of ideas to kind of dive into. But yeah, yeah, we're intentionally trying to find other sounds other than the way we play live. Sometimes it's just hitting the equipment the right way, you know. Is, is that beginning in the writing process for you? Or are you, instead of going to, like I assume, a guitar as your, uh, the, your first instrument, like mm-hmm. your go-to, is it, okay, no, I'm, I'm actually going to this series of you know, effects, pedals, and synthesizers. Is that, is that the first movement in, in the writing process? Or is this a matter of taking songs that are written on guitar or a traditional instrument and then throwing that instrument set out and then moving into this other territory? Yeah, so, sometimes it's that simple. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, okay, well, I know how this goes on guitar. We've played it this way and it's a certain thing, and but maybe it's not necessarily what we want to hear, hear on a recording, mm-hmm. I guess. I, I don't know. I think we were more, we were more interested in finding 
what else something can be and sort of taking what's already there and, and, and pushing it to something else and to mm-hmm. a further further limit. But um, some, sometimes there'd be kind of arrangement trading around. I, you know, I would come with something on guitar. Steve would take it and do a different arrangement on keyboard. Sometimes then we'd go, okay, well, the keyboard part's cooler. Let's just use that. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, or sometimes we'd start with something and say, well, we don't know what the rhythm is going to be list- like this for this, just, so let's just put up a click. And then by the time you've built it, you realize, okay, well, everything's there. Well, all we need to do is take out the click or maybe make the click some other sound. Just kind of trying to use the studio and the opportunity of working with someone who's used to extremes and, and finding new sounds to, to try to make something new. Yeah, for sure. I don't know if I've answered the question. <laughs> I, think you've, I think you answered enough of it. I, think. I answered something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, you know, this might be a strange question, but, you know, we are, we are both um, old men in the, in the context of rock and roll. Yeah. At this point, we are uh, men of a certain age uh, playing rock and roll. And, you know, I, I, I'm trying to not be closed off as I get older in general. I think it's incredibly important to kind of keep your eyes and ears and, uh, you know, I'll, might be a cheesy thing to say, but your heart open, just kind of trying to kind of make sure that uh, as, as I get older, I'm not... Getting too set in your ways or... Not too set in my ways and also not trying to create a false narrative of things being better uh, when I was younger or uh, being frustrated that, um, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. being confused by musical styles that are made for people much younger than me. Right. Um, that being said, I'm curious if you have any... Uh, and I'm not asking you to, to name anybody in particular or uh, speak about an entire genre of music, but if there's anything over the course of your career that you've grown to really that uh, upsets or annoys you greatly <laughs> as you as you get older as a musician, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I, I catch myself I catch myself grumbling about uh, people not playing instruments as much anymore, <laughs> 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 which I try I try very hard to resist. And I, I am reminded from time to time that there is really good and intense and, and new music, and valid human music being made with, with machines and computers. But maybe that's kind of what we're struggling with. We're, try, we're trying to figure out how to make, <laughs> make mm-hmm. these machines express a little bit more clearly uh, the human element, the human, the primal scream, the, the heart, the, the breath. I don't know. The thing is, I, I realize it, the, the moment that I'm looking and saying, oh, why aren't people... Da, 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 and it's usually because I'm actually pretty hard on myself about playing. And I'm mm. constantly telling myself, oh, you, oh, you need to practice more. You need to practice more. And don't let it get behind you. you got to practice. And, and maybe that's it. It's, it's my own fear. It's very real. Though. You get to be an older musician, and, and it's very hard to plan things and make sure you're really spending the time with the stuff that you used to. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> inevitably that things happen. You know, you have family, you have, you have a life and people you love and other interests and you got to mow the lawn and mm-hmm. you got to go, you know, you got to go visit your mom and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's weird. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how we land this. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, I think we are, we are just collectively floating and eventually you know the plane's gonna run out of fuel and we're gonna have to figure out a way <laughs> to to just kind of like try to land on water or something i don't know uh, yeah it's, <laughs> but but to your point uh, you know I, I i met a musician um when we were making this last record who stopped by the studio to visit rich costi who was producing our album mm. and um yeah he, he will remain na- nameless because it's not really important but he he, he was a very successful electronic a musician, you know, DJ type, mm-hmm. the kind of person who plays to, you know, thousands and thousands of people, uh, really nice kid. He was a kid. I mean, he was maybe 19 years old. Mm, wow. And uh, he did not play an instrument. Uh, he did not understand music in the traditional mm-hmm. way of understanding it. And when he was explaining his process, he was just kind of like, well, you know, I kind of work with color and, and beat and like I can see these things kind of sound like they're supposed to go together. And it was the kind of um, answer that you might expect from somebody who's just beginning in some kind of musical discipline that they were just kind of figuring it out. It was like the punk rock, mm. you know, like, I, just, I don't know, I, I learned three chords and we're in a band and that's just what it is. But yeah. 
<laughs> but that this this individual was not, you know, a 19-year-old kid who was starting a punk band for the first time and just playing basements. Right. You know, this guy's playing, like, you know, massive electronic festivals and making assuredly, you know... Way more money than we are. Way more money than anybody I know. And, you know, there was... Obviously, my first thought was a similar kind of sense of frustration and borderline disgust at the fact that someone who could call themselves a musician could not actually play an instrument. But the more I thought about it, I, I was actually kind of impressed is not the right word. I was I was kind of taken with that this individual is living in the present and in some ways the future and that music, coming back around to our some of our earlier conversation, you know, one does not have to have, you know, uh, proficiency upon an instrument. Right. Or even be able to play an instrument to express themselves musically. And to me, that's, it's super punk. It's also like, man, what have I been doing playing guitar for the last 30 years? Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm I, beating I, myself up over this stupid thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I, I will say as far as my quote unquote pet peeve, I guess is, and of course I won't name any names, but <laughs> um, my, you know, I'm very much live and let live when it comes to music that I don't like. I'm not one of those people who, at least I'd like to think I'm not one of those people who, you know, everybody likes band X, Y, Z. And I'm like, oh, band X, Y, Z, they don't burr, burr, burr. Like I, I, you know, even bands that I think are not good if they are expressing something from within themselves and this is the music that comes out of them and they're earnest in their expression, that's, that's all I really care about. Yeah, yeah. But one, one type of band that I've always hated is the kind of band that changes styles based on what's happening in the current musical right. uh, landscape. And there are a number of bands that, of course, will go nameless that have become very successful who started out as bands that were uh, of a, you know, if it was 2001, you know, they were sounding like No Wave. And then if it was 2004, uh, they were like aping the talking heads and on and on and on. Um, that, that to me is the only thing as I've seen throughout my career as a musician that really upsets me. It's like, look, not everyone is capable of original thought, you know, or original expression. That's just, you know, sure. the way of the world. But at least land on something that you're going to commit to, you know? <laughs> or at least some part of what you do. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't know. Well, we're we're as guilty as anyone. <laughs> I yeah, I guess it's in, I guess we're all guilty of it in gradations, right? We all. <laughs> I don't know. You guys, you guys are pretty solid. You guys have a, a sound. There's sort of a, a basis and this aesthetic, even a even sort of a sonic quality that sort of is always being you know, just kind of reaching. But uh, that's good. I think we I think we landed there. I think it took us a while. You know, I, I recently we did a, a, this piece where I had to review all of our old records. Not review them, but just kind of rate them all. Right. And so I ended up listening to some of our old records, you know, with relatively fresh ears in the sense that I, I don't put on our records, just listen to them for uh, entertainment that often. No. <laughs> um, and, uh, but I, I was struck with, you know, especially our first album, I can just hear the influences just so flagrantly on that album whether it's you guys or uh built a spill or you know rex was another band that i, I oh yeah, yeah yeah loved and they you know they were kind of famous for this really swung out six eight kind of feel that i just loved and um you know bedhead of course we were always trying to ape bedhead so you know it's the things that don't necessarily translate uh, people don't hear those things probably as much as one does themselves. Sure. But I was listening to some of those tunes and being like, wow, I mean, we were one click off like being like a, a built to spill cover band at this point, <laughs> you know. We had a few things that we were probably a little bit close to. What do you think those were? What do you think, what do you think those were? Oh, I don't know, a little bit of, a little bit of Joy Division, for sure, for sure Galaxy 500, there's, I mean, especially since we were working with Kramer, those were sort of the newest touchstones I, I hadn't heard Red House Painters until sort of right after we'd made the record. But I remember thinking, like, oh, okay, here's, here's someone else. <laughs> it took a while to fight off my tendencies, you know, to, to kind of follow that as well and find my own thing. But I tried to do that as well. I was also trying to... So did you have, did you have people you actually wouldn't listen to for a while because you knew it would influence you? <laughs> I, I had a few of those. <laughs> really? What, who were they? <sighs> I remember, really, you know, I, I really loved Codeine. Oh, God, I love them. And yeah. man, if, if I listened to that record more than twice in a row, it would, it would take me like a week to shake. <laughs> Everything I'd write would be like, oh, oh, 
no, that's the same. That's already, that's already, I'm totally copping the codeine feel. Same with Red House Banners, like I said. There was, yeah. I just, I was like, okay, this is, this is cool and I love it, but I keep finding myself subconsciously, you know, picking up on some of these things. And it's that constant effort of kind of like trying to check yourself, like make sure, like, okay, I really want to just, I want to do something original here. I don't want to be copying anybody. Yeah, I, I, those, I just recently put on, I bought that, Codeine vinyl box set that Numero Group put out a couple years ago, whenever it came out, and I just recently kind of went, spent an afternoon just having those records on, listening to them full blast, and I, they're, they're they're just phenomenal records. Yeah. I mean, I just to to this day, I just I I love those albums so much. I think for me, you know, when that first Modest Mouse record came out, the first two Modest Mouse records were everywhere. They were, I mean, they were everywhere yeah. in the Northwest. Every party you went to, every time you turned on a college radio station, they were just ubiquitous because they're wonderful. And and to me, you know, they kind of I think came out of a similar influence set. We we you know we don't really know those guys, but like, you know, they came out of a similar influence set as we did. I mean, the Tree People built Spill, right? You know, there was like a Northwest kind of aesthetic starting to build at that point. That was yeah, it's different. It's different from what was going on in some other places. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, I mean, it seemed like, you know, they were just young, precocious, yeah. you know, <laughs> dudes who were just like, you know, the way Eric would play just high up on the neck on the bass and then just got all, just the amount of melodic content that was being created by like these yeah. you know, three kids. And, I, you know, <laughs> I, I don't even know if they knew what they were doing. I honestly, I mean, we had, we played shows with them early on and, and man, they were just <laughs> total kids. <laughs> But they just slayed. It was really crazy. They just, yeah, they were right out of the box. Like they came off kind of dangerous. And it, I remember my old band played uh, a show with them at the Showbox in '96, and they it was like a particular type of punk that they were so punk and like Isaac to this day. It's like you know I just like he's just such an Asian provocateur, you know. And like <laughs> yeah. and I remember it, I don't hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but it's like my the girl I was dating at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I can say this because I didn't say it. This girl I was dating at the time who came to the show was like, Isaac looks like he crawled out of a dumpster. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> and it was like, he, he looked like he crawled out of a dumpster and climbed on stage and, and, just, and just slayed yeah. this, like, the, the, at any moment. It, it seemed as if the entire, you know, the amps and the drums were just going to just cascade off the stage. Yeah. You know, that no, nothing was holding this together. Reckless, reckless and beautiful. It was, it was really crazy band. Yeah, that was a band that I had to not listen to a lot because, you know, I, I enjoyed listening to them, but I think because we were so similar in age and, you know, we they were obviously going for a while before we got going, but they were just such a, a, a like an aesthetic touchstone for a lot of bands of our relative age right. group at that point in the Northwest. You, you just couldn't be as dangerous as those guys. So trying to be like them and being polite like, you know, uh, like college kids would have been just... It would just look. It would look really dumb, and <laughs> exactly. and you know, and and so I had to kind of like, whenever we'd stray into kind of like, you know, harmonic bendy thing, we're like, no, 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 stop, 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 stop. That sounds like modest mouse. We can't. <laughs> and also, like, kind of afraid of them. Like, they if they heard something we were doing and it sounded like too much to my, like, we might be confronted about it. You know, yeah, they, yeah, they'd come to your house with bats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Crawl out of the dumpster with a bat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well. No, that's all right. It's writing. You become very, very sensitive to your own influences. <laughs> For sure. And it's, you know, it's, I, I mean, it was maybe the, the mid aughts, 04, 05, that, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't quite hear it, but people would, my friends of mine would reference somebody they had heard on the radio or whatever, you know, college radio or whatever. And be like, man, they really sound like you guys. Like, and I, I was, it was, I, I, I've never been able to really pick up on it. If there is a death cab sound, which to me still is just a, an amalgamation of, of our influences, I still right. don't feel like we have a sound. We are just like, yeah, well, we sound like, you know, low and built to spill and the Red House Painters had a baby. And, and this is, you know, I'll always hear those influences. So it's very difficult to kind of point those things out. But I'm curious if, if there was a point if and when there was a point for you guys that you you started feeling as if you were having an influence on other people's sounds, that you were able to hear yourself, or that people were telling you that they could hear you in in uh, bands that were kind of active at that point. I don't know. I, I guess I, I never hear it. 
you know, I guess from a certain perspective, you say like, oh, well, anybody that's playing slow and doing harmonies, like, oh, no, there's, we can't, we can't really claim that. And so, so I think right off the bat, it's really, I don't know that I've ever heard anything and thought, hmm, that's sort of sounds like us. I, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever heard that. I mean, people have said things from time to time and say, oh, there's this one song and it sounds by so-and-so, it sounds like you guys or whatever. And, but I don't know that we necessarily have a sound and maybe is sort of a sub aesthetic <laughs> going on that maybe some people have picked up on and maybe certain elements of some of the things we do that they've they say is sort of influential but yeah I don't, I don't know no never never really had that moment you know i mean there people when people cover your song or something like that that's definitely sort of a compliment and sort of a an affirmation but i'm not sure if they're necessarily picking up what we're doing well you guys are also shift you've shifted so many times throughout the, the course of your career that it yeah. Might be also diff as as one who's tried to rip you guys off for years, it's been very difficult to keep up. <laughs> so, you know, I mean you're you're you've definitely got that going for you where it's, you know, every time we're trying to steal from you, uh, you're on to something else. So it's 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 we'll, st we'll <laughs> steal steal away because we 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 stole ours from everything else. So it's just more fragmented and hidden. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hey man, you know, look, I'm I'm so I'm so glad that you kind of made the time to do this. This was this is really fun. Thank you. Thank you for being the uh thank you for being the alpha and <laughs> <laughs> taking the taking hold of the conversation and uh asking questions. It's, it's it's good. You have a you have a very uh you have a very good nature, very strong uh very very strong personable tone. It's it's, it's good. I I usually don't do well in conversation unless someone's <laughs> <laughs> going a little bit out out of their way, and, and it, it's 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 not an easy thing to do. So so thank you for being so generous. And oh, of course. Well, you know, I mean, you know, there aren't enough podcasts in the world now, so maybe I should start my own. Yeah. And I'll I can be I can be this person. Yeah. Every week. Yeah, and I can advertise mattresses and uh, ticket companies and all sorts of things in between us speaking. I can just use my time to, this will be another revenue stream for me. I can right. kind of, because I need an exit strategy, Alan. I need a, <laughs> I need a way off the road. This crazy rock band stuff is, yeah, is, is destroying my life. All right, Alan, it was nice talking to you. I'll talk to you soon. All right, peace. See ya. All right, bye. Ben Gibbard, Alan Sparhawk, thank you so much for joining us on today's Talk House podcast. If you enjoyed today's talk, check us out on Stitcher, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. And we've also got some incredible upcoming episodes with people like Elizabeth McGovern from Downton Abbey, comedian Jabuki Young-White, Tierra Wack, Blake from Jawbreaker, Sylvan Esso, and lots, lots more. Today's engineers were Maya Jensen, recording Alan in Duluth. Mai is the program director of the fantastic KUMD 103.3 FM Duluth Public Radio. That's Al's local station. And Ben was recorded in Seattle at Bad Animals. Our producer is Mark Yoshizumi, and our theme was composed and performed by The Range. Josh Modell in Chicago, thank you so much for joining us for today's episode. Thank you, sir. Listeners, we'll see you next week. Peace. Bye.